we are live with this for the first time we're doing something kind of different we are starting a whole new thing yep that's right turn off the microphone over there so i'm not having problems so today i'm doing something completely new this is world building wednesday where i'm going to be making a couple of worlds with you hopefully we'll see how all that works out and uh, I'm going to walk through some of the basic things you need to think about when creating a setting or a world. Um, and part of why I can talk about this is because I've done this for tabletop RPGs and for um, fantasy stories. And there's a lot to think about. And I think people get often overwhelmed when they try to set up a world and an environment for the first time, and, and they get uh, kind of wrapped around the wrong... They, they focus on, on things that don't matter that much, and they don't establish the things that kind of do matter. So I want to talk about some of the, the fundamental kind of ordering principles here. And the first thing to establish is just the fact that um, uh, there is no vacuum. Right? Design never occurs in a vacuum. You're never creating a setting just on a Saturday just because you feel like it. Uh, that does happen you know, extremely, extremely rarely, but usually you want to, to, to write a story. You want to make a video game. You are a tabletop GM, and you want to uh, set up your own little fantasy continent uh, to adventure in. Uh, your own your own your own thing, and that choice of what it, your setting is for really does impact what you need to think about first. And I say that because at some point you're going to stop building your setting, and you're going to start writing, or you're going to start playing, uh, or you're going to start coding, and so you got to figure out. At what point do you have enough that you can then start working on things and fill in the details, right? At what point do you get beyond fundamentals into details? Um, and if you're doing a story, what matters most are the things that will impact your characters. Whereas if you're doing a video game where the player is cut off from society... Uh, and is perhaps exploring the ruins of an old society, then you have to do a very different kind of world building because you're not necessarily going to have to worry about things like how do people dress and how do people eat, right? Um, those things are can be assumed as opposed to everything else. Um, or more accurately, you can fill in those details, but it is larger aspects of... of, of of the things that last, as a, as opposed to the day-to-day -day details. All right, so we have to figure out what is the purpose of our purpose of setting um, is central. Okay, so we're gonna keep that in mind. Now, for the settings we're building, we'll probably end up with a purpose, but because this is a pedagogical situation, uh, I'm not going to have a specific plan in mind here. I'm just going to kind of go. Um, all right, so the point being there that your, your medium will introduce some constraints into your, your system. You know, the, the setting of um, a portal requires different thought about setting than Skyrim, okay, uh, or Lord of the Rings. All right, so what do you need to think about? Um, now, I should point out, disclaimer, you don't need to think about thing, these things in exactly this order, but I think all of these things are helpful, and we'll be doing other videos about other aspects of things and kind of um, exploring this. But let's start with some fundamentals. And I should start out, before I go any, any further, and say that I think the 
one of the big fundamental things, which you probably already have, a, have an idea for, but it's helpful to kind of nail down, is the idea of what I'm going to call tech level. How technologically advanced is your society? Now, obviously, different societies can, can advance in different ways, and advancement is kind of a complicated word, a loaded word. The way I like to think about that relates to the society's use of metal. When you look back at human history, you know, the, the history of Earth, you see that we talk about, uh, or uh, you, know, you see that the major stages in human society as being very broadly defined by the kinds of metal that are in use. When you cannot use any metal at all, when you have no metal technology at Stone Age, basically, um, simple tools, you cannot craft very um, detailed tools. You know, your axes are going to be stone axes. You cannot get sharp edges on things. Um, I mean, you can to an extent by, you know, sharpening stones and so forth. But you're not going to get a razor's edge ever. And so then you can move up into, say, uh, what, you know, we would call Bronze Age technology where you can have actual forged metal. And forged metal allows you to do a lot of things. It allows you to farm more effectively and efficiently. Um, it allows you to create weapons. And weapons are not just used to kill other people. They're also used to hunt. So your ability to hunt and, 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 and farm and such change the dynamics of your society. In other words, without metal, it's very hard to move beyond subsistence living unless you live in a garden world. Uh, and that's another thing to think about, is kind of how available is food, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So you think no metal, you think sort of you know, Bronze Age soft metal work, basically. Uh, and so that's sort of your, your Greek or Roman level of technology. Okay. You cannot really, because those soft metals do not connect, conduct electricity extremely well, you cannot have complicated machinery on the level of you know, a steam engine. Um, you, can, you can build, interestingly, you can build machines uh, and fairly complex machines, but you cannot build machines that will last a long time. They'll do the same operation over and over and over and over again for decades, uh, the way you can with harder metals. So you can experiment, but you can't get very far with those sorts of metals. Um, then you move into iron and steel production, and that's roughly equivalent to a sort of a medieval era, you know, society. And um, and I mean medieval in a broader sense, not just medieval Europe, but also like medieval China, medieval Japan, things like that, where you have um, access to iron and steel, and again, that allows you to create, um, um, th that that gives you flexibility. Iron um, conducts heat extremely well and makes a very, very efficient cooking vessel. So when you have iron, suddenly now you can make kettles and pots and cook for large numbers of people very easily and very efficiently and effectively using relatively little you know, firewood and fuel. So your society can advance. right? You can feed more people more easily with iron and steel. And you can also make more effective weapons. Uh, so you can hunt better and you can, frankly, fight war better. Then you move into, um, you know, not strictly a, a metallic um, world, but you, you get into uh, the development of gunpowder. And the thing about gunpowder is that you can only do so much with gunpowder until you have advanced steel work and advanced iron work, right? Um, you try to make a, uh, a cannon out of bronze and you can fire it maybe once, and that's it. So you need adva those advanced uh, metals of, of steel and, and iron to harness gunpowder. And then gunpowder allows you to do all sorts of interesting stuff, again, on the, on the battlefield. Um, and the important thing about gunpowder is that gunpowder shifts what war is. Gunpowder changes war from a, a matter of skill to a matter of technology, right? Um, not that guns don't require skill, but that you can train people in 
effective use of a gun um, much more quickly than you can train them in effective use of a sword or bow. And so it is a much more um, factory method, if you will, of fighting war. And we'll get to war in, in, uh, later. In fact, let me write that down. Um, war as natural state. And in fact, let me, let me type this up up here. So we have tech level. And let's create a little... Uh, where's my list? Why can't I find my list? There it is. Um, so stone age, no metal. Um, Bronze Age, again, um, Ancient Greece, Ancient Rome. Then we have um, Iron Steel, Medieval. Then we have Gunpowder, and that's roughly con uh, coincidence with the Renaissance era in our, in our world, right? The Gunpowder era. Um, and then once you have those things, you can then start building machines. And we're talking about machines that will actually, you know, things like the cotton gin, things that uh, allow us to replicate things over and over and over again over the course of years. You know, you need parts that will last, and that's where iron and steel comes in. Again, you know, you could technically build, you know, um, a a steam engine, a locomotive out of all bronze parts, but they're all just going to warp very quickly, and it's all going to fall apart. Um, similarly, you can kind of do that out of, out of, out of iron technically, but that's going to be incredibly heavy. Um, and you're just not going to be able to, uh, uh, there are weight problems with that. Anyway, um, so you need kind of advanced metallics to, to create those machines. And then the important thing about this and the important thing about the whole question of, okay, why do I, why do I care about metal? Because, um, you are freeing yourself up from use of time spent gathering, preparing food. And that is one of the other fundamental things. We'll get to that in a second. So you have um, gunpowder, then you have basically uh, the mechanical era, the mechanical age, if you will, and then the industrial age. And let's go, go ahead and digital age and the spacefaring age as roughly things to think about in terms of eras for your world, right? Um, the Industrial Age is really not much like uh, the age that we're currently in and moving into where uh, you know, the Industrial Age is still very much about physical lo location and the Digital Age is less so. All right, so I've, b I've been mentioning it. Let's talk about it as well. Um, and then we'll kind of get back to some of the, the practicalities of this. I just want to kind of get this off my chest the idea of food. So I think food is one of the things that m that it is one of the most overlooked and most important aspects of setting construction. See, everyone has to eat every day, multiple times a day, ideally. Where does that food come from? And how does that food get distributed to people? This is a fundamental question. Um, and there are a couple of different ways of doing it. And they're all very, very central. So we've got, um, I would say, three main ways. Farming, ranching, and what I'll call harvesting. Okay. You can farm a plot of land for specific food. You can um, keep animals and use them for food. Um, you can, um, and then you can harvest natural elements that you are not specifically, you know, that you do not not specifically control, uh, but that you, but that you may kind of maintain as a resource, right? So you are not t technically planting this thing, but you are. Uh, harvesting the resource. So um, th this is a bit like farming, um, but it can be things like hunting and gathering, right? If you're going out and you are looking for animals, you're looking for berries and things like that out in a wilderness where 
that then becomes your food. It's kind of different than farming or ranching. So the question then becomes, you know, is your society primarily about farming, primarily about ranching, primarily about harvesting existing resources? And what are those resources? How available are they? Right? Is this a resource-rich or resource-poor setting? And of course, that will vary depending on your environment. Some people may be asking about water. Uh, water it has to be kind of an assumption. Uh, and we'll get into that more when we talk about settlements. But the thing about water is that we all need water. We all have to have water to survive. So your society is going to have ready access to water. We'll talk about in you know, later on how to think about that and how to think about how to build your setting in your settlement that way. Um, but you don't really, in a sense, have to think about, well, will there be water around or not? There will be. You know, your settlements will be near rivers or lakes. So, your environment needs to have food available to it. If you go way back into early, early time, the large, the large majority of people owned farms and farmed it because you needed a lot of labor to, you know, to harvest those crops. Um, as we move forward in time, you need fewer people to, to manage that because machines allow us to seed, harvest, process that food much more quickly much, you know, and much, much faster, uh, which frees up more people to do other things. Uh, so, the question becomes then, in a society, how close are you to food? Right? If you're doing a fantasy, if, if, you're, if you're creating a fantasy world, there's a high probability that all of your characters grew up on a farm, or at least were farm adjacent. Um, even the nobility in the Middle Ages were you know, one step away, if you will, from farming. Like They, they lived in a, an environment very close to fields, and they would ride past farms all the time. They would see people farming. They understood how farming worked, and indeed, they were dealing with you know, farmers all the time. The, the, those were their neighbors. Those were the people that the nobles were, all their business was about. So you got to think about that. you got to think about where food comes from. A good example of this, something I've, I've struggled with, is... Uh, I was creating a world that was set entirely on earth moats floating in the sky. So big chunks of, of rock floating in the sky where basically the, the planet they're on is uninhabitable and everyone lives on these, you know, these, these giant floating rocks that are kind of magically floating in the sky. And the question quickly becomes, how do they eat? How do you get enough farmland on a few floating chunks of rock to support a population of more than a few people. You either have a tiny, tiny population, or you have farms somewhere, or you have to think creatively about your food, right? And where that food comes from and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> you have those things to think about. Um, so let's get in here to our settings. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to create two different settings. And we're going to continue growing those settings over the course of these episodes as we expand out. And we're going to see how that works. So let's go to setting one. It's an empty document. This is my setting. And we're just going to apply these principles. I'm going to apply them differently to each setting. So we'll have two different settings growing in different directions as we make different choices. So let's start. Um, I think my first one is going to be Bronze Age. So let's just say Bronze Age. Uh, um, yeah. The only metals available are relatively soft. 
Um, iron is known, but a precious metal. Okay. So that's going to set up all sorts of things about our society and what we, what we can or can't do. Um, it's going to limit the amount of, of automation, limit the amount of food available. So, th so this now implies we're going to have a lot of, it's going to be very labor intensive to get food. So now, then the question is, where does food come from? Do we have farms? Do we have whatever? Let's say this is a verdant environment. Um, um, food is, you know what we're going to do? Um, we're going to actually go with harvesting. Um, about half of all food is um, farmed or ranched, and the other half gathered from the in, um, dense foliage of the world. So this this is really interesting. I like this the idea that we're living in a in a setting in a in a in a world where there's just there are fruit trees and um, bushes laden with laden with fruit and that vegetables need to be picked up off, off the ground, that there's plentiful wildlife everywhere, and that everyone's just kind of used to, if you're going out for the day somewhere, you just grab food off the, the nearest tree. Uh, or you pluck berries off of a, off of a bush. Um, and you may come across a pumpkin patch, and you just grab a pumpkin. This thus means um, that um, property rights are, how, how do we put this, um, um, light, and there are, well, maybe not. Um, I, I want to say, so it's common to grab food from the environment, which assumes, um, we'll say clear distinctions between public and private property, right? So then the question becomes, if I have a pumpkin patch, do we assume that when anyone comes along, that anyone can grab food off of there anytime they want? Uh, or do I control that very, very uh, strongly? I kind of like the idea that you see in the Bible a lot, where there is this assumption that people could come in and like uh, grab food off of a field as long as they weren't entering into the field. So for example, if you had a, a pumpkin patch is a great example, and it was enclosed by a fence, and there were a couple of pumpkins that were laying, uh, and, and that had grown like right on the fence or right outside the fence, that if somebody walked along and grabbed that pumpkin and ate it, that was legal, right? That, you know, uh, you could not come back and say, how, how dare you? Um, if nobody did, that's fine, that was yours, but you know, it was assumed that stuff that's kind of on the border of a property was kind of public property. It was available to the public. And moreover, it was assumed that everyone would allow that to happen, right? Legally, you were, you were not supposed to contain your material and your, your, your possessions so strictly that no one could possibly do that. So let's, let's do that. Um, um, food grown in, um, uh, not just food, um, but uh, food on the border of a property is considered um, available to the public and is seen as a public good. Yeah, I'll we'll just put it that way. All of this you know, would be rewritten to be uh, you know, nicer and more clear. But that's kind of a neat, a neat idea. I like that, that setting concept. Um, all right, so food is plentiful. Again, there's some farming, some ranching, but people just kind of eat wherever they, whatever they want, wherever they go. And it's a very verdant environment. And that gives us some interesting ideas, uh, again, if you want to create some plot issues, then you know, creating a, a catastrophe that causes foliage to, to die 
becomes a big problem. Um, you know, if people can't rely on all this this foliage, if if there's some blight that comes along and wipes out a lot of this this public food, then that's a that's a big problem. Uh, it also assumes this is also interesting. This also makes um, less verdant areas uh, extremely or. Um, so we'll say people rarely venture into areas that aren't verdant, right? So when you have these areas of the world that don't, for whatever reason, have plentiful veg vegetation and, and edible vegetation around, people aren't going to bother going in there because they're just not used to being unable to, to, to just eat wherever they go. It requires a lot of preparation and effort to go into those environments. And it's not that, you know, that nobody could do it. It's not that it, it's impossible. But we can kind of assume that people are going to say, well, why would I bother going over there when, when, when it's hard to go over there? Uh, so it makes those landscapes of dead trees um, you know, much more desolate. So you're going to have this, this strong distinction between areas that are uh, populated and not populated people will kind of route around those areas, which gives you a space for adventure, a space for your heroes to go, for your villains to retreat, uh, places where you, know, you can go in solitude because people really aren't going aren't gonna to bother wandering in there. All right, so that's what we have for our uh, technology level and our view on food. I like that. And again, because we don't have machines, we can't really make much use of those those more desolate areas into, um, we'll say, less verdant areas. That's better, better English. Um, all right, so that's setting one. Let's think about setting two, uh, tech level. I think I want to stay fantasy for setting one, um, but let's move forward into a, do I want to go medieval or do I want to go gunpowder? Um, hmm. Let's do something on the edge. Uh, so this is going to be um, uh, gunpowder. Gunpowder is arriving. Well, not crazy with that terminology, but you get the idea. This is a sort of an advanced medieval world. Uh, there are there's iron, there's steel, and gunpowder is now being formed into, you know, we're getting effective muskets, cannons, things along those lines. So war is now changing, um, and we're starting to make use of these sort of combustibles, and as well as chemistry. That's another thing, actually, that comes along with more advanced use of metals, is um, uh, better understanding of chemistry. So, hmm. No, let's, let's say, say that. So, uh... Iron is commonplace, and steel is, I don't want to say rare, um, is unusual and expensive. There we go. That, that's about right. You know, people are aware of steel, but, well, no, no, it would be, I mean, once we, we got gunpowder, iron is, so we'll say iron is extremely commonplace, and steel is um, commonplace, but relatively expensive, right? You're not going to make steel uh, playground equipment, but it's easy to find a steel sword. It's easy to find stuff made out of steel. Um, and, you know, uh, so we would say um, most cooking equipment is made out of steel and a and so we'll say maybe let's say 75% of cooking uh, equipment is iron 25% earthenware because that never goes away and 25% steel steel copper alloys um, it's hard to cook with steel, 
uh, you really want aluminum, things like along those lines. But um, it's that kind of idea that, actually, no, that was completely wrong. <laughs> I've got 125%. So we're, we're going to go with um, 15%, 10%. That's better. Okay. So iron is kind of the default cooking medium. And you have earthenware and you have steel. Um, that makes sense. And, of course, we, you know, we're talking a bit more about large-scale industrial. Well, not industrial, but, you know, large-scale cooking. You know, when you're getting beyond cooking for yourself, you're generally using, uh, using a, a cast iron. All right. So gunpowder is, is arriving. Then we'll say um, um, modern armies train with muskets and cannons rather than swords and spears. Spears are very effective. Pike weapons dominated war for centuries because of the reach. Because it doesn't matter how nice your sword is, if my weapon's twice as long as yours, I'm going to kill you first. So, you know, do not underestimate as, as much as we tend to uh, lionize sword play. The, the pike and other similar sort of long, you know, these eight foot long weapons were a much more effective solution uh, for a lot of people. And in a lot of, a lot of wars, we just, you know, it's not as romantic. All right, so, but war is changing, gunpowder is changing. We also need to think about the effect of gunpowder on, you know, besides just on war. Um, so we're gonna say, um, um, some cultures are experimenting with gunpowder based machinery um, powder based and other machinery um, and other machines based on uh, chemical reaction Right, so we're starting to get to that that sense of okay, you can explode something. Can you build? Can you make a piston? Can you build something that makes that harnesses this energy in an effective way? Uh, in fact, let's just say because um, um, we're a little early for steam, but let's say basic steam engines are um, uh, don't explode. Right, that's, I think that's a <laughs> decent way of starting it to say that you're now to that point where you can make a steam engine that, that, that works um, and can power things, but, and, and they're, they're, they're practical, but as soon as you get much more advanced than just simple steam engine powering something, you have problems. So we're starting to get the idea of locomotives, the idea of, of, those sorts of machinery and the ability to automate tasks much, much more effectively. This means you get consistent coinage, for example, because you can do a, like a steam-powered machine or just a, a, you know, a hand machine that can stamp out coins. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, food. Farming, ranching, harvesting. I like the idea of, of ranching. We have a you know farming is just kind of the the obvious default. Um, although maybe um, there's a different way of of getting food. Maybe you can, you can you can farm something that's not so your typical wheat or rice, uh, your typical sort of grain staple. Um, you could do ranching. I mean, ranching is not bad. Uh, it's just unusual in, in for you know Western civilization. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I think um, um, ranching is um, uh, half of all food is ranched. Put it that way. So yeah, let's do it that way. We'll, we'll say that our food comes from ranches that we that we that this society keeps animals specifically for food. And let's say 
I'd say, I'd say most. Um, well, I was gonna say ranches are commonplace. Meat is common. Uh, well, meat is common through ranching. I'm trying to come up with a, a, a more definitive, you know, striking way of put it, put, putting that. But basically, I want this idea that most people eat meat. Most people, um, you know, most people grow up more on ranches than on farms. So you're keeping livestock, which is then you know butchered and harvested more than you know large scale farming. There are still farms, and and large scale farming exists, but ranching is kind of the default as opposed to farming. Um, oh, there we go. Ranching is the default food um, uh, method. Most people grow up on ranches, uh, growing and um, butchering. We'll just say it. Um, uh, what's the term for like a ranched animal? For a, uh, uh, it's not just domesticated, but it's it's meant for eating. Um, we'll say domesticated animals. Okay. So you have you know, the equivalent of, of cows and such that you do that. And let's, let's say further, um, these animals have been bred for many centuries for this express purpose. Um, and there are half a dozen, let's go crazy, there are over a dozen different um, species bred that, that only exist for uh, food, as food for humans. I'm also going to assume in this that it is, it is a human-based culture. We're not going to go too wild about having everybody be, you know, crystal blobs or things like that. We're just going to go human-focused for simplicity's, simplicity's sake. All right, so it's a very meat-based society. Let's go even further and say um, some of these animals are barely um, uh, um, barely conscious. We'll say it that way, um, having been bred into uh, extreme stupidity. So we have these these animals that are, you know. <laughs> their job is to sit and eat and they just do that over and over again and they do not yeah, there is no purpose for them beyond this you know you do not have wild um, wild what's the term sorry brain fart uh, you do not have um, large numbers of these things out in the wild right they just herds that's what I'm thinking of um, you know so horses for example you can eat uh, but cows, you know, there's, there's, we, we don't have wild cows in the developed or the, the, uh, you know, the, yeah, I guess we call it the developed world now. So that's something to think about. Okay, so we have that. That's interesting. Uh, and then some of them are just, you know, are barely sensate. They're, they're just kind of meat sacks. And we can get into kind of the, the, the morality of that, if you will. But yeah. Okay, um, that, that also allows us to, to, to have people who are like, you know, I'm not comfortable eating most meat, but, you know, these animals are basically just, you know, piles of flesh that just kind of grow and, and, and then are butchered. Um, so I'm not really killing a, you know, an intelligent, thoughtful creature. Gives us a, a few more options. Uh, all right, so that comes, that that's, sets that out. We can think of some more things around this world and how things will work. But one of the advantages of, of that, so one of, the, one of the interesting things about that, um, not necessarily advantages, is that uh, ranches require land. So this means um, there are vast tracts of land, and people generally live, we'll say that they live in large groups on shared ranches. Uh, so instead of having you know, one family on a thousand acre ranch, you're going to have a few families all working the same thousand acre ranch, if, if you will. 
um, which further means um, people generally travel large distances. So there are multiple um, mount and pack animals. So here's, a, here's our first sort of big difference between the other setting in a way that has grown out of that setting instead of something that we set up um, in, in the beginning. I think in, in our first setting, this very verdant, lush environment, people do not go very far from their homes because there's always food around, because it's a very, probably a very safe environment. We haven't entirely figured that out yet, but it's just, you can get food near home, you know, that's fine. When you're ranching, you have to, you have, to have grazing land for those animals. Those animals need food, and so you need a lot of land for their, for their food. So that means people are much more mobile, uh, and they're going to have their, their favorite mounds and things along those lines. We'll probably have something like uh, you know, two or three different kinds of, of mounts. So a, a um, you know, horses, ponies, donkeys, kind of a, a, a different thing. Although I think I want, I want to make those significantly different. Folks have domesticated multiple different animals for riding. Uh, and they have pluses and minuses, right? Some are very fast but tire out quickly. Some are slower but you can ride them forever. Kind of like the difference between, you know, horses and, and donkeys and such. But I think I want them to be like just different species, right? Very, very different physically. And uh, we'll, we might go kind of wild on that. I, I get a feeling that setting two is going to be a little more wild, whereas setting one will be a little more domesticated, a little more domestic. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. So, okay, so we have our, our two settings. And another important thing, by the way, about building a setting is to realize that your brain partly works in the unconscious and the subconscious. So it's important when you're building a setting not to try to build it all at once. Once you get started, ideas will come to you over the following days and weeks and months just because that's now stored in the back of your mind and your mind's gonna be processing that all the time. So you need to build up space and time for that to happen instead of trying to do all your world building in a week. Um, it's much more effective and efficient, ultimately, to spread that out. So just be aware of that. So let's review our settings real quick. Um, so setting one, Bronze Age, again, sort of equivalent to our Roman, ancient Roman or ancient Greek era of the world relatively soft metals. Iron is a known, um, but we'll say a relatively, but we'll say a very, exp a, a, an expensive and rare metal. Those two usually go hand in hand. Uh, let's, let's go further and say most cooking is done with um, earthenware, um, and some uh, copper brass. Okay. So again, it kind of gives you a sense of, of domestic life and a sense of what you can and can't cook, right? Where like you can you can build an oven because an oven is basically just bricks and heat, um, but you it's harder to fry an egg in an effective way. Um, uh, you know, in a way that's very controlled. Then food is plentiful. About half of all food is farmed or ranched. The other half gathered from the dense foliage of the world. It is common to grab food, food from the environment, which assumes clear distinctions between public and private property. Um, food on the border of a property is considered available to the public and is seen as a public good. So, this raises the other question of how common farming is. I mean, we know it's, there, there's a lot of farming and ranching. But it's only about half of, of all people. So what are they doing when they're not doing that is an interesting question. Um, you know, if half the population doesn't have to farm or ranch to survive, if there's enough food for them, what are they doing? Hmm. We'll have to think about that. And there's just a lot of it um, out there. And so people rarely venture into less verdant areas. It's just uncommon. So we, we have this sense of this almost Garden of Eden environment where folks can just explore, or where folks can just, you know, eat whenever they want to, drink whenever they want to, and it's a, a, a very safe environment for humans, so to speak. Setting two is an era where there's a lot of, of metal use. Iron is extremely commonplace. In fact, let's go further and say um, 
Um, or is very common. Um, so we'll say um, okay. So this is this is a place where metal is is relatively cheap. It's quick. It's easy to find. You know, you basically dig down anywhere, and you'll you'll start to find some some of these ores, and so you can start kind of refining and, and building metal very quickly. Um, or is very common, um, much, um, uh, there are a lot of volcanoes around, we'll just say that. Um, so there's less um, verdant countryside. So I'm, I'm imagining this is actually kind of a world in contrast where, uh, and we're not talking, you know, complete volcanic hellscape. But we're talking about an environment where you, know, you think Hawaii is volcanic and it's beautiful, but it's an environment where um, um, it is more. Uh, there's a lot more land that is used for mining. There's a lot more rocky ground, put it that way, and uh, a lot more sort of rocky environments than lush jungle, if you can imagine that. Uh, which means food is more scarce in that sense. Which means folks have focused more on metal, on, on collecting metal, on, on 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 mining metal and refining it. So iron is extremely commonplace. Steel is steel is commonplace, but extremely, relatively expensive. Um, three quarters of cooking equipment is iron. Fifteen percent earthenware, ten percent steel, copper alloys. Okay. Modern armies trained with muskets and cannons. So uh, gunpowder is becoming becoming the the new hotness, if you will, in warfare, and that's going to be a that is always a very difficult period for armies to completely change how they think about that and the role of the warrior in society. Um, this also allows you to change, and this is worth pointing out, when you have mechanized war, you can have essentially a volunteer army. Uh, it becomes easier in other words bladed weapons require training and so you either train the populace in how to use those weapons all the time so in medieval europe in medieval england rather for example everyone was expected to own a weapon uh so that they could defend the peace uh which meant that everybody was kind of trained in martial weaponry so that when they went to war they all had some basic ability to swing a sword or fire a bow um but that's not necessarily true in all societies. In China, for example, uh, people generally did not have martial training. So you had a dedicated warrior class. When gunpowder comes along and suddenly you can train a peasant in firing a, a gun in you know, a couple of months, the warrior class has much less to do. And so they have to transform themselves into something very different. Like they have to become a, a, a class of, of leadership or a class of art. Um, you know, in Japan, for example, the as as the samurai role became less necessary, it became a a a role and a, and a cast of honor, of refinement, of spiritual purity, where you know, being a warrior was being like a, Sha a Shaolin monk, where you are dedicated to all these principles and living in this particular way, where you know your ability to kill other people was almost a tertiary component of that. Now, you know, obviously, it's, it's couched in the idea that everything is in the service of that. But day to day, you know, you may never draw your sword in your life uh, to kill somebody out, uh, uh, else. You may do it for, for training. Uh, so day to day, you're just kind of doing your thing. Uh, and you're, you're, you're thinking about yourself as this role in society not as a killer, no, not, not, not as a, a soldier, and that's just very different. Um, so we'll have to think about how that is changing things. So ranching is the default food method. Uh, most people grow up on ranches, growing and butchering domesticated animals. The animals have been bred for many centuries for this express purpose. There are over a dozen different species that only exist as food for humans. Some are barely conscious, having bred into extreme stupidity. Um, they are vast tracts of land. People generally live in large groups on shared ranches. Travel larger than multiple mountain pack animals. Okay, so again, we have this idea of kind of a Wild West environment where there's huge tracts of land um, 
this also brings up this interesting question of the border of environments. You know, how do I know when I'm on one person's land and I'm off of that person's land? So I have to think about that, about how you, you mark off territory. It might be vague. It might be one of those things where people are just, you know, kind of, eh, uh, like in the Wild West. Uh, but there, there also might be specific markers. You might have, you know, use marker stones. Uh, you know, now that there is widespread metal use and widespread machinery, maybe that is how people are marking off their territory. They're creating, maybe there is this ancient practice of setting up marker stones in certain spots. It could also be that an environment like this, a more rocky environment, makes it easier to do this because you don't have you know, huge amounts of foliage constantly overgrowing your marker stones. So you can set up a marker stone and it's going to be visible for years and years and years. We'll have to think about that. But I, I like that idea that maybe, maybe property is a little more vague or the boundaries are more vague. Uh, and people just kind of live in these zones and it's... You know, it's not that you, you go exactly, you know, 58.2 miles from this house and that's the end of this property. Or it could actually be that, you know, a property could be measured in essentially circles from a settlement. And so all the land within, you know, 30 miles of this spot or whatever is, I mean, that's, that's massive actually, uh, within, you know, a few miles of this settlement is that ranch. And people just kind of know to respect that boundaries. And there would be some, sometimes when it's kind of, uh, you know, they, those encroach a little bit and folks, um, that, that's <laughs> the stuff conflict is made of. But I'm not sure about that. So those are our settings. We've been going for about an hour now. That's a good amount to think about. Um, and now I'm saying I'm offline. That's kind of cool. How weird. Um, yeah, Okay. Anyway, so that is the beginning of, of World Building Wednesday. I'll be coming back probably every Wednesday, uh, if I can, and we'll be hitting on other aspects of world building. So I think the next thing we'll look at as, is settlements, you know, what you need fundamentally to build a, essentially a household, you know, a place where people can survive and live long term, what, what needs to be there. And what does that look like? And you know, what, what do families look like? And, 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 and things along those lines. And to go, what is the atomic settlement? And then we can kind of uh, branch out from there into, into questions of larger society. So that's the basics. Thank you all for joining me. Again, we should be back every week with more of this. Hope this is useful. And um, see you next time.